Looks like I'm already recording. And okay. So inside is the Kai site under Intro Flash, Scenes and Tweens. Flashback, Scenes and Tweens. These are the things we've covered in Flash so far. So I'm going to go back and uh, just demonstrate some quick examples. Let's make a new Flash file here. So everyone's hopefully familiar now with the Flash timeline. We've got our first uh, free layer and frame, and then more frames down to the right. As the frame rate continues, we move to the right at the frame rate indicated down here. So one second, two seconds at 24 frames a second. We have this concept of regular frames where nothing happens except time ticks by. But we can also have keyframes, and that's how we indicate the flash that a change has happened. So I'm going to just quickly scribble in here and add another frame. You can see in the timeline here, empty keyframe as indicated by the hollow circle there, and then empty frames because they're white. And then on frame 35, solid keyframe, a solid circle for keyframe, indicating there's some content there, continuing on until something changes. That's the basics of the timeline itself. Then we have layers like we have in many computer development programs. They're visually based. So I have layer two. I'll, if I draw anywhere on layer two, because there's only one keyframe, let's choose a different color here. It'll fill the whole area. All right. Okay, so my squiggle on layer two here, you can see it's above layer one. I can change that by changing the sequence here. I can also make it no longer uh, overlapping based on the timeline. My playhead's uh, in frame 37 right now, but if I go to frame 30 and insert a blank keyframe, oh, blank keyframe that is, insert blank keyframe. Now at frame 30, I've told Flash to make a change, and that changes, it's empty. And back in frame 37, now <coughs> it's just the one thing. Other items we've covered is the idea of locking a layer so it can't be changed by you, um, and removing the visibility. Remember, if you hide a layer in Flash, unlike something like Photoshop, if you hide that layer, the ultimate user can still see its contents. You're only hiding it for your purposes as you develop and work in that space. Got some timeline basics. So let's introduce some tweens into this animation here. I'm going to start by making a sloppy tween. And I'll hide these other layers. So my sloppy tween will have character here. And he's going to move across the screen. I can do that simply as just right clicking the space in the timeline there and choose create motion tween. It's prompting that I'm creating a symbol. We know what that is now and we'd like to do that more deliberately but when we're just mocking things up or trying things out we can say okay. And now if I move this character the tween will handle the in-between points between those two spots because it's a motion tween anytime you move or anytime you move the subject of your tween, a new keyframe is dropped in that keyframe that the playhead is on. So playhead's on frame 23 now. If I move the subject of my tween, flash drops one of these little demi keyframes for motion tweens right there. And in my case, we get a new waypoint along the animation. Also with motion tweens, we can add angles. Each little circle along the way here represents a frame in the timeline. So if we wanted this animation to take less time, I can select some space in the timeline and remove frames. So you can see less frames through here. It'll go by faster. And then make it take longer. I can insert frames as well. 
we've got more frames now. So that's a really basic motion tween built in the sloppy method. What happens we built in the sloppy method is a symbol is created in the library. It's not that big a deal in a motion tween because we can go over and say, that's our dude, get things organized in that method. But when we deal with classic tweens, it's a little bit more of an issue. So I'm going to draw a new character here. Classic tweens require a keyframe at the start and end. So insert a keyframe at the end and create a classic tween. So what's done is automatically made me two symbols of the type graphic between these, these two tweens. If I move the symbol in frame 55, I get a nice motion, uh, effectively a motion tween, but a tween that involves a change of position. But if I put my cursor in the first keyframe there, select it, and choose properties, we see instance of tween one appear in the properties. If I go to frame 55, select our subject of our tween, instance of tween two. So we double their characters. If we make a change to one, it won't reflect the other. So we want to um, have a more organized flash movie. I can fix that now by just swapping two for one. <coughs> and I can even delete two now down here. I'll call this dude two. And the most deliberate way to make a tween, a motion pure class of tween, is to create the symbol beforehand, either by clicking create new symbol in the library or on the stage to a shape this time. Select my shape, choose convert the symbol, make it a box. We'll cover our three types, but for now we'll go with graphic. Now it's already a symbol. If I Insert a keyframe at the end and make a classic tween. No additional symbols created. I can work with it as such. Our last type of tween of the three is a shape tween. Shape tween is the only tween that does not work with symbols. It's as simple as I have a shape, and then later on, another keyframe indicates either entirely new shape or slightly changed shape. So I'm going to change it just a little bit there with that spec and create a shape tween. And that is what Flash chooses to do for my shape tween. Would you go through the, <coughs> the shape tweens for the words, like how you shifted the one word and put the word? Uh, sure, let me come back around to do, doing those words. Okay. Um, so my shape tween here. I wanted to make a little more interesting tween. I could actually get rid of what was previously there. And if I make a dramatic change, like let's go with the color and the proper shape, this is now the shape tween. Flash will try and tell you when there's problems with the tween. So if I Delete that. You can see up here, dashed lines tell me I need to end up with another shape. Please give me another shape. Same with this classic tween. If I delete one of the symbols, then it's trying to tell me I need another symbol. I can't tween anything. Let's do the uh, text tween now. Seems simple enough. I'll make a new movie clip. And instructions are on Sakai, but I'll do a quick one now. So we're going to go from uppercase the to lowercase the. I typed out the text. Text can't be used for tweening of any type. Has to be a symbol first for the other two uh, tweens, motion and classic. Or for shape, has to be a shape. So there's some tricks to this particular task. First I want to break it apart. When you break it apart, let's say a word or a sentence in flash, it breaks it apart to the representative letters or glyphs. 
What I can do now is if I take what I have selected and right click that, I can distribute it to layers. This is a handy shortcut to get my um, tween set up. So I take everything I selected and right click and choose distribute to layers. It gives me a layer for each letter. So now they're actually letters. I could go in there and change them with my cursor if I wanted to. So it's important now that I do another break apart. Yeah, um, making sure that each of them get that affected to them. And now I have actual shapes, not just letters I can change to my cursor, but shapes I can change to my <coughs> selection and subselection tool. That's all set up. I'm going to go down the timeline and insert some blank keyframes. And I'll put the in in lowercase and may as well change the color. So I do a similar process now, except you'll notice that they just happen to all be on the T layer and I want to distribute these back to the representative layers to make that shape tween happen. So that's an important step. One thing I'll do first is I'll turn on the onion skin view of the timeline. That will let me select a couple of frames so I can see back into the past. And I can line up these letters so that they make a better tween. I'll turn that off. Then do a break apart. Now they're just the letters. Time to distribute them. This time around I can't quite use that handy distribute layers trick, so I'm going to do a cut. Go to the correct layer, paste in place. Same with the E. Cut. Go to the correct layer, paste in place. <coughs> and now it can't be a shape tween yet until I do a break apart. And now they're shapes again. All that's left to do, add those shape tweens. And they're good to go. So shape tweens has to be a shape, and there's a little additional learning there as far as what kind of text can be used in tweens, which is you can't use text, you have to break it down into a shape or turn it up into a symbol. All tweens have properties. This is where you can set the easing. A, a large positive number eases them out. Uh, a large negative number eases them in. Um, easing is the amount of frames dedicated to which end of the tween. So ease out means more frames dedicated to the end. You can think of it in that time way of more frames, or another way to think about it is like a train coming in and out of a station. Uh, you're helping it um, ease out of the tracks and into the station if it's a high number, so slowing down gradually. If you have an ease in, it's gathering <coughs> speed slowly. And then with classic tweens and motion tweens, you have additional options as uh, far as rotation. You can set those on the property so you can get perfect 360, 720, etc. Next, I'm going to quickly publish this. Let's say this is, I'm really proud of this particular bit of uh, text tweening here. So I'm going to save this to my desktop, name it the. If I wanted to work on another machine, this is where I could change it to an older version if I needed to, but leave it on my desktop. If I wanted to test what this will look like to an end user, I can go to Control, Test Movie, and Test. And that's what it looked like. See, I've got the bandwidth profiler turned on. It tells me what frame the playhead is in as it plays. Only available when you're testing the movie. So far, so good, but now I've still got my FLA and I've got my SWF file, SWF file going to the web. If I wanted to actually wrap that in a web page, have the code for embedding it in my published settings where I can choose to have or not have an HTML wrapper created. It's also where I can make things like animated GIFs or GIFs. So turn on GIF, animate. And if I press publish here, 
That will ensure when I go to my desktop, I have the SWF as, that I got when I was testing and the HTML file that I could use to get the embed code for a web page. And I also chose to have an animated GIF given to me, so that was published as well. So that's through file and publish. So back in our original movie, we had a number of symbols. Um, here's our library. What I'm going to do is start an entirely new scene. Give me a fresh timeline, but the same assets in the library. And go back and forth to the scene selector. I'm going to bring in, let's go with Dude 2 here. One instance of Dude 2, if I go to Properties, Instance of Dude 2, I can tell it's a graphic. We'll get to those types of uh, symbols in a second. I can drag out more instances. If I double click any one of those instances or double click the same symbol in the library, I can make a change to all of them. So let's make Dude 2 bright red. Or give him a red uh, torso and such. There we are. So you can see immediately that changed all of them. You can tell by the breadcrumbs when I'm actually inside the symbol versus back on the main stage. But, so that changing the symbol's contents applies to all the instances. Handy when you have one asset you want to use in a number of places. But you don't always want to use things like position and scale over and over again. Each instance that I have here, you can see in the properties, is in a different position. That's fairly intuitive to most people. Um, what isn't as intuitive to most is the width and height is a property of the instance. So that can be changed as well. I can rotate it. I can scale another. Every instance. If we jump back to scene one, there he is red down there. One common library per file. Um, scenes get fresh timelines and layers, but the library stays the same. Very good question and observation. Other properties we have for a symbol on the stage is things like its brightness, its tinting, um, and its alpha, effectively visibility. So I could use a half alpha to give that kind of faded in, faded out. I could even take um, one of my instances of dude here and bring a whole new instance right here. Use a classic tween. Insert another frame at the end so I can build my classic tween. Insert that classic tween. And if I start on the first instance and change its properties on the alpha to zero and make sure it's 100% in the final frame. The effect is a fade in effect. So you can use a number of classic tweens and uh, layers to get a fading in and out effect of something, a gallery or whatever. Um, this is a good use of the classic tween over motion because there is no motion involved. So when it is just properties on the actual keyframe, the classic tween does a really nice job of isolating that. And one of the other properties being, uh, let's go back to the first frame here. Things like the tint. So if I turn down the colors and turn up others, I can get different tintings to the same um, symbol in that instance. <coughs> Any other questions about, so really quickly with audio. Um, when we're dealing with audio, we can import from a wave or mp3 file into our library. Uh, Flash also has common libraries we can draw from, window common libraries and sound. So whenever we're working with the common library, um, if you're watching this video later on, we couldn't hear it in class either. There we go. So it feels like you should be dragging it onto the timeline because that's where it's going to show up, but you actually drag from the library onto the stage and then it shows up in the timeline after that. 
And it corresponds with the length of time of the audio clip, this kind of oscilloscope of the sound. So insert some more frames to see the whole thing kind of play out. Test the movie. So in practice, you are not likely to have sounds on the main timeline. It's often useful to contain them within movie clips to have a little more control over when they get fired uh, or, or played or not. There's also a action script which would, we haven't quite gotten to, to stop all sound, which could be helpful because when um, things start to loop, it just layers audio on top of itself. Also worth knowing, never use the common library. Drag something from the common library into either your library or the stage. It will show up in the library. And now that copy is going to come with you in this file. We also covered buttons. Speaking of the common library, one of the other common libraries is buttons. Common libraries, buttons. So I'll bring in this oval button. There we are. If I test the movie, it should be clickable. I'm a little worried about this oval button. Let's try another one. There we are, you can see my cursor. And those are now part of my movie, so that's on library's buttons. Okay, so let's build a button from scratch. Gonna take a circle here. And I'm gonna convert it to a symbol. We'll circle back and make sure we've done all the types of symbols. But I think it's pretty obvious this one's a button. Double click. Now I'm inside the actual button. The button is the only part of Flash that actually changed is the names of frames. Um, and it's uh, no longer are they numbered, but they're labeled up, over, down, and hit. So you can have a functional button that doesn't have anything new in those other frames and the principle and flash of whatever is in the keyframe to the left will continue to the right applies or you can specifically decide what you want to happen when the mouse is not touching the button or the, the up state when the mouse is over the button the over state I'm going to just um, abuse this drawing to demonstrate that the down state, when the mouse is being clicked upon it. And then the hit is really unique in that the user never sees the hit. It's your opportunity to def define a bunch of pixels that will be clickable. So you can use that to complement the interface you've designed to make it easier to click by giving some uh, margin of error around it. Or to do silly things and make weird spots clickable. So if I test that, up, over, down, and the fact that I can click this area defines the hit, and that I can click over here defines the hit. You can also layer inside your button. The uh, examples from the common libraries often have layers inside their buttons. So you can see it defines a lot there. Um, including using the hit in just one layer because that's all you effectively need. Yes? Okay, so that leaves us with just defining our three symbols. I'll make a <coughs> new file just for the sake of it. We just had a pretty good example of a button where um, when we create a button, we get those unique frames up, over, down, and hit. We've already seen that when you enter a symbol, you can double click it to edit in place or go into the library and edit so um, we can explore that but first let's just make a fresh symbol there's a general prin principle when developing for flash to use the least complexity possible both for bandwidth and organization issues you want to bias towards the least complexity possible so if we only need something static then we would use a graphic Let's make a new graphic.
So I'm making a new graphic. I did it through the library, not on the stage. You can see I'm inside the graphic here because the uh, um, breadcrumbs top. I can do my doodle here. Just like on the main timeline, it defaults to put me in layer one, frame one. I can use all the layers I want in the graphic. I can put things in frame two and beyond, but once it's actually in use, the um, first frame is all that will be visible in my movie. Unless I start doing some advanced manipulation with ActionScript, assuming we're developing just with our mouse, only the first frame is visible of a graphic, nothing after that. You, you can do, if you're being um, uh, creative in your use of Flash, uh, start storing extra assets out after frame one, but only frame one is displayed um, regularly with a graphic. Again, we need symbols to do any kinds of tween, so if the tween involves nothing more than a static image, a graphic is a great example. So let's take this graphic, drag it onto the stage, it was built inside the library. Is there a keyframe? Cross it tween. Move it over here. So, a movie clip will be the next one to look at. It's much like a graphic. It's its own timelines and layers. Uh, and we can use more than one frame. And by default, it will start playing through those frames at the same frame root rate pardon me, as the rest of the movie. We cannot change the frame rate between a movie clip and the main timeline. That's consistent throughout. What doesn't have to be consistent throughout is the number of frames before that automatic looping happens. And if we know something with actions, we can control that looping as well. So I'm going to make a, um, a movie clip from the stage. I'm going to choose a shape here. I keep pressing that key. Place it right there. And I'm going to convert this to a symbol. So, movie clip one, all set. Oh, I put sharing a layer with an existing tween. Big sin. Let's put it on its own layer. I'll pretend that was deliberate. Going into my movie clip, you can see we went from having uh, more frames in the main timeline to back to having one by default. I can insert more. So I insert another uh, keyframe in two. And I'm going to rotate that clockwise 90 degrees to another keyframe. Rotate it again. Insert another keyframe. get this kind of effect without a tween, a frame-by-frame -frame kind of tween that doesn't involve Flash's help at all. So that's only a four-frame movie operating inside the context of a 25-frame movie on the main timeline. So it's going to loop about five times before the move, a little over five times before the uh, movie is done. Six. So that's a simple movie clip. It's got its own layers. It's got its own a number of frames, but bound by the same timeline. Let's take another uh, try at our movie clip here. I'm going to add another layer. And what I'm going to try and do is put a tween inside my movie clip, because that's a very common uh, task, but has a little bit of complexity. So I'm going to take an oval. And we'll make a tire ultimately. So I'll convert that into a symbol. Spinning tire, it's a movie clip. Okay. Double click. And then what I want to do is have a tween to have this tire rotate. So when I double clicked into that movie clip, it ceased being a symbol and is now a conventional shape as it was before I converted it into a symbol. 
So I'm no longer on the main timeline where it's still a symbol. I've double clicked it and I'm inside of it where it's back to being a regular old shape. So, need a, a symbol to deal with the tween. So let's convert this again. This time into a graphic with our law of least complexity. And I'll build a simple tween to have it rotate. Because it's only dealing with rotation, sounds like a good use of a classic tween. And then in the properties, let's choose to <coughs> rotate clockwise once. And that's all set. So I can see inside my spinning tire movie clip, it's rotating. Back in the main timeline, I can't see that animation when I move my playhead because it's not happening on this timeline. It's happening on the timeline inside the movie clip itself. But if I do a test movie, test movie and test, I can see it happening because both get playing out at the same time. Ever want to make a modification to that tire to make it, you know, give it a hub, make it look more convincing? Double click. Now I'm in the movie clip where that rotation happens. I could make a whole nother tween and layer to put the hubcap on, but the uh, least changes would be to double click again, enter into the graphic names. Um, what's, what's their name here? Uh, I just slot between unintentionally. Oh, let's mop that up. So you should be tire graphic, and you should be. I'll check the tape later to figure out what I did wrong. Oh, and now it's off center. Hopefully this is a learning opportunity. So let's set this back to zero is all it is. And set this back to zero. And I think negative half the dimensions I guess we have to go with. There we are. Fixed. Okay, um, so now we're inside the graphic <coughs> again, and I've caught myself making that mistake. Here's where we could add another layer. I'll choose the oval and a different color. We can add that uh, hubcap or uh, wheel. Now if I test that movie, because it's inside the graphic, it's um, exactly positioned with the tire, which makes the most sense. And then because that graphic is inside that uh, movie clip with a classic tween, it's getting the rotation. And it's um, having all that motion isolated into the easiest ways to maintain my uh, movie, and hopefully the simplest way to do everything. And the last thing to recap from our basic intro to Flash is just the actions for the basic timeline control, what I informally call Action Script 1.0 because there is no 1.0. Um, our best practice is to have all of our actions contained on one layer. In Action Script 2, um, which we're building the 3, when we're still in 2, we can put actions in a whole bunch of places. One of the changes in 3 was to limit that place, and in 2, it's just the best practice to limit as well. And further, really handy to have all your actions on one layer. Actions follow the same principle of only being applied to keyframes. So for example, in my current movie, if I wanted it to stop at the end, I could add a keyframe at the end. And then the easiest way to put actions on that frame is to right click that frame, choose actions. Now I've got the actions panel up and I can tell by the bottom tab here, 
exactly where those actions are going to be applied. So we're going to add some timeline control of stop. There it is. You can see the timelines now have been modified to have a little uh, lowercase a on it, telling me their actions here. And if I do a control test movie and test, the main timeline stops on that frame. The constituent movie clips are now continuing the loop because they have no instructions other than to loop, but the main timeline has stopped. You can see in the bandwidth profiler, we're stopped in that last frame. I can apply it to movie clips too, so isolating motion to movie clips, this is another reason we can stop them at different times. This weird frame by frame movie clip I made, let's go into that, add new layer for just their actions, and let's stop that at the end. Insert keyframe, making sure that's what I want, I intended to select, I'll type in stop this time versus having the directory help me. And there's the outcome. I think it managed to play through its four frames faster than you can really notice it. There are other actions you can add. A go to and play and go to and stop. I'm going to just quickly comment this out, which we covered briefly. I can use the helper up there, type it myself. So go to and play and go to and stop are basic timeline control. Play has things, uh, tells it to go to a specific frame and continue playing from there. Go to and stop to stop a specific frame. We just type in the frame number or a frame name with parens around it with a string. Um, but a frame number is simple enough to use to go back to frame 10 and stop there. Really simple actions. Uh, apply to the uh, timeline and then as we get more complex we're using them in other places. That's our basics for um, Intro to Flash. We covered the tools individually in the first class. I had you guys give us brief summaries. Um, we're assuming that that strip of tools is a core function for modern drawing computers, but if you have questions, let me know. Knowing how tweens and movie clips and graphics all work with each other plus buttons is core when we move on to our other actions our brief stop through two and the three um, as we move further and further away from using our mouse and more as our keyboard having these core skills are really important so with that I suggest we take a break we'll add some complexity after this um, well